Hey folks, welcome to the Blue Line CNC live stream. We'll be getting started in just a few minutes. This is the part of the broadcast where we allow YouTube to get their engines fired up and put out broadcast notification to channel viewers such as yourselves that will be going live. We have just under 3 minutes and 30 seconds to go, so go grab yourself something to drink and relax. The show is about to start. Well, hey there, everybody. Uh, happy Thursday evening. This is our third live stream, our third one. So uh, if you've followed the first two, we've gone over some stuff about how we create the flags in, or how what my workflow is like in VCarve Pro and how I create the flags. We're going to go a little bit more in depth tonight with how I establish my tool paths and how I choose the bits that I want to use to carve the flag. So let me jump over to the comments right now and see who's on board. Uh, Blaine, good evening to you, sir. Mark, good evening to you. Uh, Brooks Martin, welcome once again, sir. Um, let's see. We've got William Coleman in the house. Um, 
John Thompson. And hey, guys, don't be afraid to pipe up and tell me where you're from. Um, I'm coming at you uh, live from Redding, California, where we had a great day today. Uh, nice and sunny as compared to some of the weather that we've had over the previous few weeks where it's just been raining nonstop. Uh, today, I think it got up to almost 68 degrees, which for us uh, this time of year is just absolutely gorgeous. Um, let's see. Um, Southern Joe, good evening to you. Uh, John, John Thompson from New Jersey. Nice to see you, John, over on the East Coast. Welcome aboard once again. Okay. Um, like I said, we've already designed our elements in Illustrator and brought them into VCarve as part of the design or CAD process of Vectric. Uh, and if you weren't with us on those few episodes, I'll bring you back up to speed and show you where we're at. But tonight we're going to be talking about establishing tool paths on our flag as part of the CAM process in Vectric VCarve Pro. And another part of this critical CAM process is choosing the right bits for the job. So we'll examine what bits I use uh, the majority of the time and why I use them. Um, they're my go-to bits for about 90% of the flags that I create. And with, with some minor changes here and there. Um, so I'll link all these bits in the description of this video of this video when I'm done with it and I compile everything before this video uh, goes out on replay. I will put all that information in there. So if you're interested in the bits and you want to get them, if you if you want to make these flags and you want to use the bits that I use, uh, all that stuff will be in there. I'll have links to them. So we last met three weeks. Like I said, we last met three weeks ago when I attempted to do a demo uh, using Adobe Illustrator and my internet was kind of somewhat questionable. I don't know what my resolution is looking like for you guys tonight. Uh, I even dropped down a little bit further to 480p. Uh, not ideal for me, but uh, the Starlink is not all that it's cracked up to be as far as upload speeds. Download, it's great. I can stream videos and get all kinds of stuff down on my downstream, but it's the upstream that they really, for some reason are throttling me back. And I don't know why I'm, I'm lucky if I, I don't even know what speeds I'm getting, but it's, it's probably unacceptable uh, for doing a lot of the stuff that I really, really want to do. So maybe in the comments, you can uh, sound off uh, and tell me uh, how I'm looking, how I'm appearing. Uh, and that'll kind of give a gauge, give me a good gauge as to what it looks like. So, yeah, but uh, as far as Illustrator, Illustrator went uh, three weeks ago when I was last on, uh, I did have some problems when I was bringing uh, the program over into my other screen so I could share that screen with you. And I lost some of the associated windows and it just kind of totally messed me up. Uh, so in an attempt to um, recap uh, some of... Uh, um, um, what am I trying to say? In an attempt to try to recap some of those key concepts that I wanted you guys to know, I've gone ahead and I've created about 15 minutes worth of video. Uh, it, it's comprised of two separate videos, but I'm going to try to clip them together uh, on the fly and play them for you one after the other. Uh, in the video, I'm using a different patch. I'm going to the Tucson Police Department in Arizona, and I'm just going to do a quick like I say, I think this first one's like seven minutes and the next one's eight minutes. I think it totals to be about 15 minutes long. And just to go, just going over and recapping some of those concepts within OB, Adobe Illustrator that I was uh, trying to get out to you guys during this last time uh, that may have uh, not gone through due to the uh, internet glitches that I was having. And like I say, some of the Adobe Illustrator issues. So with that, let me go ahead and play the first first demo video. Okay, so in this quick video, uh, we're going to recap some of the uh, Adobe Illustrator essentials that we went over last time in uh, converting a raster image into a vector image so that we can use it inside vCarve Pro. So as you can see, I've got the Tucson Police, Arizona 
uh, or Tucson, Arizona police patch uh, already uh, brought into Adobe Illustrator. And just for the, uh, the purposes of this quick demo, I'm only going to uh, demonstrate some of the things that we went over last time. Uh, just for those of you that may not have seen the first go around. So we're going to go ahead and let's select that by the actual graphic by clicking on that, that layer. And let's lower the opacity down a little bit uh, so we can see what's going on when we do our trace. Uh, and I can see that it's fairly in alignment vertically and horizontally so I don't have to make any adjustments. If I did, I can just come up to the one, one of the corner handles here and click and drag, but I don't need to. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, lock that so it doesn't move. And what we want to see next is the rulers. I'm going to go on Window, uh, Rulers. Uh, where is it? Let's see if I can find it. Find it. Where is it? It's not there. Well, view, excuse me, not window. View, rulers, show rulers. And we're just going to, uh, let's create another layer just so we don't get confused. And let's call it guides, or guide rather. And let's drag a guide. And before I drag a guide here, I want one vertical guide. I don't need any horizontal guides for this design. but. I'm looking for some element on this patch that's going to get me approximately in the center or as close to the center vertically as I can. And there's nothing here except one element, and that's the star. And if you, if I look at this point here and this point here, uh, that's going to uh, provide a center point for a vertical alignment. So I'm going to come over here to my ruler. I'm going to click and drag. I'm going to place that guide right uh, as close to possible that I can get on the star. And if I need to move it around, I can click on it and move it around. And I can see that it's not in alignment here with here. So I'm just going to go ahead and kind of put it right in the middle of those two somewhere. Right about there. That looks pretty good to me. Um, so the first thing that I'm going to go ahead and do is lock that guide so it doesn't move. I'm going to go ahead and create another layer. Let's call it uh, border, B-O-R-D-E-R, -E and go out a little bit. Let's use our curvature tool over here, and on the border layer, we're just going to come up here, and starting on the guide, we're just going to click the contour of this border and all we're trying to do is trace this outline and match it. Double click there. And come down and hit this guide right there. So that's pretty close. Uh, I'm going to hit escape on my keyboard. Uh, there's nothing on the stroke or fill, but I do want that stroke to be black in color. So I'm going to come over there, make it black. And let's go ahead and use our uh, selection tool. And let's select it. And let's uh, copy it. And let's uh, paste it in place. And let's hit right click on our keyboard and transform and hit reflect and that uh, creates copy and pastes it in place we reflected it so now we'll select ok let's click it drag it so it's approximately in line should be able to if you got your snap on it will uh, align to the, the uh, first one that you made so let's hold down shift and select that one with them both selected we'll click on our original uh, and you can see what it did it made that the key object uh, and then we want to make sure our align to key object is selected then we're going to come down here to align uh, distribute spacing horizontal distribute space and what that does is that oops is that moves that over and joins it uh, with, the, with our original. 
So we'll come back over here. We'll use our direct select tool. We'll select that uh, top point. And then we'll come down here, right click and hit join. We'll do the same thing down here with this bottom point. Right click and hit join. Now with our path, it's a closed path now. So with that selected, we will go ahead and uh, attempt to uh, try to get as close to the thickness as we can. That is the border of this patch and it doesn't have to be exact. So it's at one point now. Let's bump it up. That looks pretty good right there. Um, looks pretty symmetrical, looks good. So let's use that, 18 points. And while it's selected, let's just go ahead and hit Object, uh, Path, Outline Stroke. And that converted one single stroke into two. Uh, it made an outline uh, on the outside and on the inside so that when we import it into VCarve, uh, we have something that we can uh, use to uh, a go-between, go so to speak, for our end mills or our V-bits. Let's do what we did with the border, just so we get a nice stroke. And let's select it, Control C to copy it to the clipboard, Shift Control V to paste it in place, right clip, right click, excuse me, transform, reflect. Okay, and let's bring it about. And let's select them both. Make sure you're aligned to key object to select. We want this to be the key object. And again, distribute spacing on the horizontal. So that brings them both together. And we're gonna select our direct select tool, right click here, join. So that gives us a, a, a symmetrical line to follow. So, We've got our path that we're going to create text on. This is going to be text on a path. Okay, guys, so that was uh, video number one of two. I'm going to play the second video now. Uh, if you have any questions throughout these two videos or if this... Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, if, you, if you've got questions about it, by all means, uh, put them in the comments. And then when we're done with this, we'll jump over there and we'll have a little brief Q&A before I go on to the rest of the stuff that I want to talk about tonight. So here's uh, video number two, uh, which continues where we just left off. So with our path established where we need our text, we're just going to come over here to our type tool. And as you can see, the type tool is selected. So we're just gonna click and hold and we're looking for type on a path, which is right here. It's the third one down, we'll select it. And we're just gonna come over here and uh, we're just gonna click on that path. And once the text, it just gives you the lorium ipsum text. So we're gonna replace that with the word Tucson uh, in caps. So T-U-C-S-O-N. And the next thing we want to do is make that at least as tall as this text here. So we're just going to come over here to select the font, set the, the font size. Before that, we can do that, we actually have to select the text. And then set the font size and get it as close to as possible. And that looks pretty good, my friends. So now we got to select a font that looks pretty good to or as close to as possible uh, with uh, the existing font and we're looking for thickness and height and everything else here so I think I'm gonna start with a cumin variable concept I have 91 uh, different variations of that font so I should be able to find something in there that uh, comes close and it doesn't have to be exact uh, in most cases, you're going to be the only one that knows if it's not exact. Um, so if you can find the exact font, that is, uh, uh, that's great. Um, but oftentimes you can't get the exact one because you don't know what the patch designer or graphic designer used in the original, or, or original artwork, excuse me.
So with that one selected, I'm going to go where it says default. I'm just going to drop down and I'm looking for, I want to get out of the condensed ones. Um, maybe uh, now we're getting into something that uh, semi bold, maybe, maybe bold. Yeah, I think bold is going to be it. Let's go with, because black looks a little too beefy. Let's go with bold. And once you get your font selected, that looks pretty good to me. We're going to come up with our uh, selection tool. We'll click it. And then this middle grab handle right here, we're just going to move it around until we can approximately get. I like to start with this first letter and get it in alignment. And then as you can see, by the end of this word, Tucson, it's no longer in alignment. We need to get the edge of the N out to the edge of the N here. And that's achievable just through this uh, selection tool right here. That's the tracking. So let's go ahead and uh, increase the tracking on that. And just press and hold until you get your uh, desired results. Now, if we go back up and we do look at black, and the more I look at it, black does look like it might be the way to go. So let's select it and bring the tracking back down. Yeah, that does look pretty darn good. So that is how you do uh, text on a path. And I'm not going to show you how we do this type of text because that would be silly. I'm um, just trying to show you, like I say, a quick recap. We did the more complicated text here. This is straight text. Uh, I mean, I could literally come up here and just come up here and type P O L whoops, L I C E. And again, um, just get it right down here where we want it. Uh, let's get our font the size we need it and we can also reduce the uh, tracking as well and we can get as close to as possible now it looks like it's starting to get a little crowded there so what I would do is just use the uh, horizontal scale function and then get what you need there so Pretty achievable, pretty pretty easily achievable. And then we have a star we need to create, and that is uh, achievable under the star tool right here. So we would just simply come over here and try to get as close to the middle uh, of the star as we can. And uh, once we can get into uh, as close to the middle of that star, we're going to hit uh, hold down Shift and Alt at the same time. And we're just going to pull out with our mouse. And that will get us a nice uh, symmetrical star. Come up here to our selection tool. Actually, it's already right on the vertical center line. So it just looks like we just need to come down a little bit. And let's swap the fill and the stroke on that one and bump up the stroke a little bit so we can see it. Now we just need to create some numbers inside here, 1871, uh, some Arizona text right here. And uh, we're done, my friends, with this Tucson Police Arizona patch. Uh, and this is probably about the easiest patch you're going to find out there. There's probably some other ones. I know Dallas Police is another easy one to duplicate um, because it's just strictly, uh, like I say, it's text, a border, uh, some text, and a star. And there's really nothing else to it. There's no other elements to it. So if we wanted to shut the original artwork off and see what we've got, um, that's what we've got. It's a nice, clean vector image. And uh, in order to... Uh, do the same thing with the text that we did to the border. We would have to select those text elements, come up here to type, and then come over here to create outlines. It's no longer editable text at this point, um, but what it does, it gives you the ability to come over here and uh, take the uh, stroke off, or excuse me, the fill off and place a stroke on uh, if you wanted to view it that way. And you could do the same thing with the star. In fact, I would recommend it uh, because what you're trying to do here is the same thing. 
I would probably bump that stroke up a little bit. Object, path, outline stroke, and then stroke uh, swap that uh, stroke and path down a little bit as well. So there you go. We've done a recap on how we uh, create police patches and trace out a vector from a uh, raster graphic. All right, guys. So uh, again, just a quick recap uh, of what we went over uh, about three weeks ago. Um, obviously, these are basic graphics. Uh, we could get a lot more complicated with badge detail, uh, and I do on some of the stuff. If you wanted to see some of the designs that I've created, for example, just hop over to my website, uh, www.bluelinewoodflags.com. Uh, if you click in the upper right, you can, you'll can you find a link that says Shop Vector Graphics. Uh, that's just a small sample of what I have available for sale. You don't have to buy any of them. You can just look and see some of the stuff that I've done out there uh, in this manner by uh, tracing uh, the, uh, ras the raster uh, images and converting them to vector graphics and then bringing them into... Um, VCarve Pro and cutting flags with them. So let's go to a few comments and see if any of you have had questions about what you just watched so far. Uh, let's see. Um, Colorado Woodworking, a little low res, but can hear you loud and clear. Well, that's good. I mean, that's better. It sounds better than what was happening uh, last time. Uh, when I my video was really cutting out bad. So I'd rather be low res than no res. Uh, Brooks, a little off topic question. I'm inspired with your gantry underlighting. Are they bright enough for you? Yes, sir, they are. They are very bright. Um, big difference when I uh, didn't have the lighting on there. These aging eyes uh, was ha were having a hard time seeing some of the detail stuff. And once I put that, uh, under light uh, underneath the gantry on there, it changed the game. I It, it really did. Um, you guys know what that's like when you're in a dark restaurant uh, and you can't see the menu. Um, same thing. Uh, and you take your flashlight on your cell phone just so you can see your, your menu and what you want to order. Same thing here. Now I can kind of see all my tool paths, what's going on. I can, it just, it really does help uh, to answer your question. Uh, Blaine, Occasionally fading in and out. Okay, hopefully that doesn't continue. Uh, John saying the same thing. Dan Goris, say hey, welcome, welcome to the uh, live stream. Um, Brooks is asking. Let me put it up there. Uh, can Adobe Illustrator convert AVIF and web page files to JPEG? Um, I'm not familiar with what an AVIF file is, uh, but I can tell you I have imported WEBP files and I have uh, converted them or I've saved them as EPS files and Adobe Illustrator files, which are high res vector images. Uh, and I don't see why you would want to save it to a JPEG. Uh, since that's a raster and it's lower image, it's pixel based. So I, I know I've done in the, uh, the web page, uh, files and I've saved them to, uh, um, illustrator and EPS files. Like I say, um, Mark Lindsay, I'm trying to resist the urge to invest in illustrator rush. You're not helping. <laughs> Have you tried Illustrator, Mark? Like I've said to you before, you can try it for free. Uh, they give you 30 days. Uh, that will probably twist your arm into buying it rather than deter you. I can almost guarantee you that. But uh, with that said, uh, if any of you guys, you're not obligated to buy Illustrator. In fact, I would say uh, try them all. You know, you may find that some of these um, free ones out there are the way to go for you. Uh, Adobe Illustrator uh, does, uh, I think it's a standalone cost. Uh, Mark researched it last time and it was like $21 or $22 per month uh, to have it in the cloud with you all the time, wherever you go. 
And uh, if you want the whole creative suite from Adobe, which is their entire software suite, Premiere Pro, uh, Photoshop, uh, Adobe Illustrator, Lightroom. I mean, you get the whole Adobe Acrobat. You get the whole nine yards. And that's like $54 a month or something like that. A little pricey, but if you use it for business, hey, it's tax deductible. Um, let's see. Mark, see how easy that tracing was. I'm telling you, I'm thinking hard about getting Illustrator. Um, video and audio are fine so far. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know what's going on with um, uh, Starlink. I, they're just, they're not what I knocked up to be or what I what I was hoping them to be. Uh, but then again, uh, I'm used to well, like where I worked before was uh, fiber and it was, screaming fast so and then out here in the boonies uh where i live uh we had at&t dsl and this tonight would not have been possible on at&t dsl uh and then once the uh waiting list my waiting list time was up and starlink said hey you're eligible to get your starlink equipment i jumped on it so fast uh because i knew that was the only thing that i could do to even live stream out here in the sticks so uh let's see um uh, colorado woodworking yep video improved during the stream my comment was 20 minutes ago oh okay good uh let's see uh brooks martin thanks aspire recognizes jpeg and bmp and you know um I'm sure, I don't know. I've, I've never used those ty file types in, uh, even in Vector, uh, Vectric VCarve Pro. Uh, always gone with the Adobe Illustrator and EPS files. They've just worked for me. Uh, and that's because I want the precision of a vector, of a vector-based uh, file uh, when it comes to doing this stuff. Um, if you're doing the bitmap trace function within VCarve or Aspire, I'm sure you could bring in uh, a JPEG, and that's probably what you mean, and then uh, turn that into a vector graphic from there. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that, Brooks, if that's what you meant. Uh, let's see. Mark, oh yeah, the first hit is always free. Uh, no, I haven't tried it yet. Yes, yeah, uh, seriously, try it out. See if you like it. They give you, I believe, 30 days and if you don't like it, you're not under any obligation to buy it. I don't even think they require a credit card during the trial period, which makes it even more desirable uh, to try. Uh, so no obligations. Uh, Mark, thank you for clarifying this. VCarve and Aspire will import an Adobe Illustrator AI file and EPI, EPS files. Yes. And they'll bring it, they'll will allow you to bring in JPEG files so you can use their bitmap trace function as well. So, uh, but you can't, a, a, a raster image such as a, a, um, a uh, what am I trying to say? As a uh, bitmap by itself, uh, you can't create tool paths from that. So, uh, Brooks just need to import an image into Aspire to generate a 3D model, yeah. Uh, the problem I was having when I tried doing that is uh, getting it exact. And I just found it was so much easier to do this in Adobe Illustrator and use the power of Adobe Illustrator to uh, get everything just the way I wanted and get those graphics fine-tuned and then bring them into VCarve uh, like we showed you during the last live stream. I just found that to be easier doing it that way. Uh, and it was the precision factor that I was looking for. So, um, okay. With that said, I want to show you guys a flag and then we're going to go into some of the bits that I used to make it and some other bits that I use, uh, to carve my flags with. And then we're going to go back to that Abilene flag that we do, and we're going to do some toolpath designing. So let me pull this flag out. Uh, some of you, if you've watched any of my, uh, videos, and I don't know how I'm going to do this without holding it up and get my arm real straight here, if I can get it to where you can see it. Um, so there's some tool paths here, like these, uh, these stars up here are made with a 90 degree V bit. Um, these, uh, stripes are made with, uh, two bits, 
a half inch end mill and an eighth inch end mill. And I apologize, I'm hiding here behind the flag. Uh, and then the rest of the design of uh, the patch itself in the uh, uh, upper right here is uh, comprised of a, uh, let's see, I could pull the file, but I believe that is a uh, one eighth inch end mill or no, excuse me. That one is, let me feel it. I'm, I have to feel it because I'm not looking at it. Uh, that's a 60 degree V bit. And then uh, the bottom badge to the uh, lower right of it is a com uh, combination of a 60 degree V bit and a 45 degree V bit uh, to get all the details of that, uh, of that element. And right here in the uh, center of the badges where the uh, 45 degree V bit came in. And uh, I'll show you what those bits look like. Um, just in case you wanted to know what the back of my flags look like, uh, I use uh, some supports, some D rings, and then I use the laser on uh, laser uh, to uh, put my branding on there. So I want my uh, products to look good both on the face and on the backside. So put that there. Excuse me. So uh, in some of the videos on YouTube. I uh, demonstrated how I flatten my flags. I used, fi it's all fixture based. Uh, I use specific offsets when I place my uh, wood panels down and then I surface them. And I just love this bit. It's the um, Amana 2255. It's a three wing heavy duty, they call it a heavy duty spoil board surfacing and planing fly cutter and slab leveler. So, I mean, this, this thing is a beast. Uh, I know uh, Mark uses it quite a bit in, in his workflow. Uh, I use it constantly in mine. Uh, it's, it's pretty big. Um, and it's what it's got on it is it's got little inserts that you can, uh, that screw out when they get uh, dull and you just rotate them. There's four positions where you can rotate it to get a fresh cut. Uh, and then once you're up with those uh, four positions, you just unscrew the little insert and put on a new insert and you're good to go. Uh, and it takes three inserts uh, for this bit. Uh, it's not cheap. I'm going to tell you right now, I want to say it was well over a hundred dollars, uh, but you get what you pay for when it comes to, uh, uh, to uh, milling bits, as most of you already know. This is an Amana and uh, uh, 2255. So, and I will get, again, I will put links to all these bits uh, and you don't have to go with these. These Some of these are pricey, uh, but like I said, you get what you pay for. Um, they will last you a long time if you take good care of them. Um, my go-to bit for the Union, the stars that I just said were, uh, like I said, it's the 90 degree uh, V bit. And again, I use an insert bit. This is, so you have to get the number to refresh my memory. It's an RC-1102, again, an insert bit, and it's a 90 degree V bit. And that's what that looks like. And let's see here. Now, when we get into uh, the actual uh, stripe cutting, I use a, uh, most of the time I'll use a half inch end mill and that will hog out uh, uh, the majority of uh, the, the, the stripe. Um, I have gone on some designs where it gets a little tight. I'll use a quarter inch end mill. Uh, and I'll show you that one next, but this is the half inch. This is my go-to for that. This blue, it's a spectra coated bit by Amana. Um, I've been told, I don't know how true it is that the spectra coated, uh, bits are a little more designed for heavy duty use. They last a little longer than the regular bits. So, uh, that's why I have chosen to go with the spectra bits. I've used this for, uh, a lot of flags and it is not showing any sign of dulling whatsoever. This is an Amana 46206 K. The K on the back of that just means it's spectra coated. Um, the quarter inch that I've used for the stripes is a 46054. Pull that out of its case and show it to you. Again, 
nothing spectacular. It is a uh, spectra coded bit. And once again, 46054K. Now, on this flag, let me show this to you again. Um, it's backwards, so I have to look. Uh, these corners of these stripes, uh, a quarter inch end mill and half inch end mill is not going to get you tight in on these uh, corners of these uh, stripes here. And it's not going to get you uh, in to this detail like what we see right here. So what I use for there is I change out my uh, end mill uh, when I'm doing the cutting on the um, CNC and I throw in an eighth inch a uh, bit. And uh, I do the secondary cut on the stripes with that. And that's also a spectra coded and it's a 46051. Again, it will be linked. And then my other two go to or my other two go to bits, that was a little awkward saying, uh, is a 60 degree V bit. It's a 45624. Again, um, Spectra coded 45624K. It's quarter inch shank and it's a 60 degree V bit. And then I use a 45 degree uh, V bit quite a bit. And this is a 45613. Now, this bit is a ZRN coding. It's a, I believe it's a zinc coding. And at the time I was looking for the 45 degree V bit that I wanted, I couldn't, for some reason, couldn't find one with a mana that had the spectra coating on it, but I did find this uh, zinc coating and it has uh, worked wonders for me. Um, this is rated, I think, for actually cutting aluminum and brass and uh, non-ferrous metals. So it, it just screams through wood. I think the inches per minute on this thing are like, like almost 300 inches per minute it's rated at and i don't run it that fast uh it scares me to run it that fast to be quite frank uh a bit that i do use once in a while um not all the time uh and i already discussed the 60 degree v bit but if there's times where i need maybe um bigger uh letters or something like that i will go with this 60 degree v bit uh, which can do everything that the other 60 degree V bit can do, uh, plus some. It's just, it's got a wider working area. And this is um, the RC1108. So, sorry, I'm still not sure about that. I've got Siri talking to me on my watch. Let me shut that off. Let's see. Any comments about the bits so far? Uh, Mark, I love that bit. Uh, oh, yeah, the 2255. I'm assuming that's the one you're talking about. Yeah, that's a screamer, too. Um, let's see. Yep, Colorado Wordworking says, yeah, that's a great uh, fly cutter. I haven't. Uh, I've got another fly cutter, and I don't offhand know what it is. Um, and I used it to uh, surface the... Uh, uh, MDF surface. But then once I used it on my, my, uh, CNC, my Avid CNC, when I first put it together, I found out it was too, I, I mean, I ran the whole program and I tried to get it to come over and hit the edges, but along the back edge of my CNC, the way I configured my spoil board, uh, it left, it, it would not go all the way. So I needed a wider, uh, milling bit and ended up going with the, uh, with the fly cutter, the 2255. And then that was able to reach that extra quarter inch or half inch uh, that I needed past the other bit that I had. So um, what chip load, Colorado Woodworking, what chip load do you target with the three eighth inch bit? Uh, good question. Um, I don't use it three eighth inch bit. Are you talking about shank size? Um, I just go with the default chip loads. I load my um, uh, all my Amana bits right from Amana's tool base or uh, what they what, from their um, their guide that you can download into Vectric. And I use their default settings. And even when I like buy a bit 
that maybe I haven't used before from like bits, bits or a white side or something like that. I've got a slew of bits that I haven't, that I've used and that maybe I don't have the specs on. Um, I will oftentimes go in and find something compatible with Amana's uh, tool base and bring it in and use those numbers for their chip load. And I've had really good success with that. Uh, I don't have any three eighth inch. I'm assuming you're saying three eighth inch shank. I don't have any of those bits. I've never used that size before. Uh, all of my bits are half inch shank or quarter inch shank. I do have some one inch, one eighth inch shanks. Uh, I have some collets where I could use three eighths inch bits, but I've I've never broken them open out of their packaging. They came with the CNC machine and they're still in the original packaging just because I don't have any of those uh, bits to use them. Uh, yeah, you, just since I have a lot of hardwood, uh, most of the wood that I use for, for my products are oak. It fairly hardwood, uh, not as hard as some others out there, uh, but uh, definitely harder than the softwoods like pine. Uh, but I find oak to be a very versatile wood to uh, work with. So let's go over. So again, we've talked about bits. Uh, I'm going to link them all in here. So if you're interested in the actual links uh, and you want to buy them, I'll, I'll provide those links for you. They uh, go to my Amazon affiliate account. It won't cost you anything extra. Uh, it helps my channel out. It helps me out. Um, so uh, yeah, I'll, provide those uh, links for you there uh, for everything that I use. And again, they're just, they're go-to bits for them for making these flags. Uh, you'll find you won't need anything else if you use them. And I plan on doing a separate video specifically for uh, the bits and uh, what you need to uh, uh, create flags. So let me pull up my flag here that we're going to use. Let me put it in my other monitor here. And I'm going to share the screen. Pardon me if this takes a second. And let's present. Okay, so if you were here with us uh, over the past several uh, live streams, you guys uh, probably remember this design that we've been working on. And now it's time to show you how I go ahead and establish my tool paths. And like uh, you guys, uh, let me get rid of some of these uh, things that we don't need here. Get, get it out of the way. Uh, let's see. We don't need that. Um, and let's uh, just kind of, I'll show you my workflow on, on how I do this. And if you've been around and, and have done the CNC stuff for any length of time, your, uh, your second sense uh, is going to tell you what specific bit you need to accomplish the tasks that you want to accomplish. When I first started out doing these, um, I was so confused. You know, I didn't know. I'm like, eh, how's this going to look? I'm not sure. I found myself actually cutting MDF blanks, um, you know, that were big enough to uh, hold the uh, patch design or the badge design that I wanted to duplicate on the CNC. And I would put that uh, piece of MDF on the CNC and, when I, and I would go ahead and cut my design on MDF and I would examine how I liked it, yay or nay. Uh, you know, if it was a yay, I would then go ahead and use those settings and bits and I would go ahead and jump into the actual flag design with that, uh, with those bits. And then a lot of times I was finding that they weren't working and that's kind of how I learned in the beginning was doing all my designs on MDF and it, it Actually, it was time consuming because I was doing all my cuts twice, but it saved me uh, from ruining a lot of oak by doing it that way. Uh... 
That was weird.
There, now you can see me. Uh, so we've got everything grouped uh, on this flag, but we don't have tool paths yet. So now comes the quick part of creating tool paths. Um, or actually that was the quick part, grouping them. So let's select the first and the first one that we're gonna do. And when I create my tool paths, I like to create them in the order that I know I'm gonna run them. Uh, and I'll always start off with the bigger end mills first, or the, excuse me, the bigger shank diameters first of my bits and then work my way down to the finer uh, shank diameter. So in this design, I, I automatically, I know that my biggest shank uh, on the bit that I'm gonna use is a half inch. Uh, and it's gonna be uh, this tool path right here. And uh, we also said this one right here is also gonna be a 90 degree. So let's come over here to tool path and we're gonna make this a V-carve bit. So we're gonna hit V-carve. Our start depth is zero. We're starting from the surface uh, and there's no flat depth. We're gonna select a tool. And again, I've brought all my bits in from a mana and it's right here. It's 1102 insert V-groove. 90 degree. So again, um, uh, Colorado Woodworking. Uh, chip loads, again, I just use whatever uh, a mana is telling me to use. And I have found that if I don't stray from that, it works great. I don't stray uh, my feed rates, uh, my uh, plunge rates or anything. I stick with what they tell me and it it works good. It really does. Uh, if anything, I will slow it down on the machine, uh, but I'll never speed it up. So, so we're going to go ahead and call that tool number one. Uh, that'll be the first tool that runs. And let's go ahead and just call it stripes or let's call it 90 V. Not, or excuse me, star, I was going to say stars, but it's not just stars. There's a stars and then there's a border of that patch. So let's just call it 90 degree. And you can see that gives us our tool path for the stars and that outside border. So the next thing we want to do is uh, we're moving down in shank size again. So uh, that's our half inch. There's no more half inch uh, shanks that we're going to use in this. So we're going to go to quarter inch. And the next thing I like to do, and this is just my workflow on making these flags, is these stripes. So let's close that tool path out. And the stripes is going to be a pocket tool path, as you saw on the flag that I held up and showed you. Um, and it's already got it pre-populated with the bits that I use. And uh, the cut depth is 0 0.0625. I go a 16th of an inch on my stripes. Uh, works perfect. Uh, it uh, get the results that I'm uh, after when I go for that depth. And so we're going to go ahead and let's just look over everything and make sure we like it. Uh, again, 46206. Let's just make sure that's the bit that we want. Is that the, that, that is the, yep, that's the half inch. Then we're coming in and we're doing the details on these corners with the eighth inch. So we will go ahead and keep those. On this first bit, the half inch, I do want it to be a raster cut. We're going to go uh, in the conventional style cutting, and we're going to use a last profile pass. Um, profile or ramp plunge move. Uh, I do this with all my end mills. I ramp them uh, just to kind of save them. It's not good to just take your end mills and plunge them directly into your work surface. Uh, always take them at an angle. Uh, and you'll find your bits will last a long time if you do that. Uh, I do them uh, one or twice the uh, uh, size of the, uh, twice the width of the bit. So it's a half inch bit. I will ramp one inch. So pocket allowance, we're not going to worry about that. And let's call this stripe. Oops over here can't even see it right. and let's go ahead and close that we've established that tool path 
Now we want to get uh, this toolpath and the inside border. And let's go ahead and that one will also be a V-bit or a V-carve, let's say. And we are going to go with that one. Let's use our 45624. And just so you know, to refresh your memory, that was, this is kind of small. You're not going to be able to see it. It was this little 60 degree V bit. That's going to do all that work, believe it or not. Uh, so we're going to select that bit. And whoops, got it the wrong one selected. 45624. Select and 60 degree V-bit, calculate, and there we go. That tool path is taken care of. Uh, now we're getting into the 45. We've got a V-bit that we are, um, let me go zoom in here so you can see it, that it's going to uh, carve out in between here and we're also going to use that same uh, 45 degree V bit, except on this one, since there's not a double line that we can do a V carve between, we'll just uh, either, uh, we'll, we'll do a profile cut on that and uh, we'll be able to achieve pretty much the same results that we're getting uh, as if, if it were a V carve uh, between two paths. So for the star, Let's close our 60 degree V bit. Let's jump back up to V carve. And we're starting at zero again. Our bit on this one is going to be the 45613, which was that zinc coated 45 degree V bit that I showed you. So let's select that. And we'll call it. Whoops, yeah, 45 degree V bit. I'll V carve because there is another place. Let me use that 45 degree. So let's calculate that, continue anyway. I'm not worried about any errors it might have said. I think there was some duplicate vectors in there. It might have copied that star twice. So we're only doing it once, so I don't care. Uh, let's go ahead and close that. And let's select our uh, last element right here that we said we were going to do a profile on. So let's come up here and select profile. And just kind of from past experience, when I use that mil or that surfacing bit, uh, and I work from that fixture offset on my CNC table, and I'm going back and forth with that 2255. That is getting that oak so flat. It's it works so nice uh, when it's especially when it's sharp. It gets it so smooth and so nice. Uh, it's so buttery smooth. Uh, I know that uh, there's hardly going to be any depth variation in the surface. And if I do a profile uh, and I only go in slightly into the, the material surface, uh, I get results that are amazing. Uh, at least uh, from my experience. So uh, let's start out. The start depth is again going to be the material surface. The cup depth, I'm going to go 0, 2. We're going to keep that just the way it is. And so only two hundredths. That's all I need uh, to uh, have that design pop through. Remember, these flags start out black. And if I uh, take them and I go two hundredths in with that 45 degree end mill, uh, bare wood is going to show through. It works great. So. Uh, machine vectors, we're going to go on those machine vectors for that uh, profile. Uh, conventional cut, we don't need a separate last pass. No tabs are necessary because we're not uh, going through the material. Don't have to ramp anything. Uh, everything looks good. Let's call it 45V profile just so we can differentiate it uh, from the 45 degree V bit. And let's calculate that. So you can see what it did is it put that as a profile cut. <clears throat> Excuse me.
Oh, apologize. Uh, so that uh, brings us back. So with that, let's go ahead and close that profile. And let's go out. And let's hop over to 3D and see what we got on this flag. So there's our tool path. And let's preview all and see what this bad boy looks like. So you can kind of see uh, what we've got so far. And if I change the view on it and zoom in, you can see what these uh, carves look like and uh, might even take the 90 degree V bit uh, and use it for the police word right here instead of the 60, because as you can tell, uh, that 60 does cut kind of deep and we uh, may want to change that. But that's uh, subject to opinion. Uh, everybody has their workflow and likes uh, the way that they do it. So you can see how the star cuts versus the way that profile uh, cuts right there. So let's go back up and finish uh, the officer's name and his service dates. And that is uh, fairly easy to do. We'll just come in here and we'll create another v v carve uh, uh, toolpath. And this time, the only thing we really need to change is the starting depth uh, because our stripes that we've cut out are a certain depth. And if we start out at zero, our uh, text is not even going to show up. So we want to start at 0 0.0625, our stripe depth, uh, which was 1 16th of an inch. And again, we want to use, uh, and I just know this from doing these flags over and over again, we want to use a 60 degree V bit with the quarter inch uh, shank. And let's see here, everything else looks good. Select, and we will call this, uh, let's call it officer text. It. Now, if we jump back over to the 3D view and we go ahead and calculate that, whoops. There you go. So we can get our text that we're trying to achieve on that police flag. So let's see if we've got any comments here. I'm assuming you got me back. Uh, once I, and I know what the problem was is for some reason when we started, uh, I, I don't know what happened. You guys saw that black kind of screen happen and I didn't, I wasn't paying attention and I got blasted from the screen in the process. But um, I, th I think you guys got the gist of it when I popped back on and I was able to put myself back on in the lower left of the screen. Uh, I, I hope this all makes sense. Um, let's see. Mark's got a question. A lot of folks have problems with machining marks in the bottom of pockets when using multiple bits. How do you address that issue? Uh, Mark, I have that same issue. Uh, it's it's not something that um, is easily that I've found that is easily uh, overcome. Um, there's micro sanders. Uh, I've used sandpaper uh, and just kind of worked it very slowly and methodically when I'm all done. Uh, and that seems to work pretty well uh, at removing those machining marks, uh, especially like up in the corners uh, where those bits come to a stop and they start to move and go back in another direction. Or that eighth inch comes in and hits those little corners uh, and you kind of get some of those machine marks. I know exactly what you're talking about because I've had to deal with them. Uh, I've heard that um, upcut bits don't with uh, that our flat bottom uh, won't cause those issues. Uh, I don't have a lot of experience with upcut bits. Most of my designs use downcut bits uh, just because I want clean edges on those stripes. I don't want to have rough edges where I need to do a whole lot of sanding. But I have heard that upcut bits, uh, because they're pulling material up, uh, 
if and I think the hard part is going to be finding the the one that's perfectly flat on the bottom uh, won't leave those um, machine marks. So maybe you guys with experience in upcut bits can uh, tell me a little bit more. Um, let's see here. Colorado Woodworking, I found a last pass of one tenth or excuse me, one hundredth is good but you need a flat bottom bit. Okay, that answers that question. It's I, I think it is the fact that it is a flat bottom bit. Mm. Now, while we're on the subject of bits, um, let me pull myself up. Let me go ahead and remove that. So if you can see that, um, that's the half inch end mill and you can see it is not flat at all it's kind of got a curvature uh where the edge of the edges of that bit if it's running in a circle uh and it's going in the direction it's supposed to be going um and it's moving it will mill out that wood but the problem is is where it stops and maybe it doesn't move all the way and it comes over so it will leave those witness marks so to speak um uh, so I could definitely see where a flat bottom bit uh, would be advantageous. Um, so yeah, that's kind of going to be probably my next investment is a flat bottom quarter inch end mill or a half inch end mill. Uh, Mark, yeah, most upcut and downcut bits have an almost fishtail bottom. Not all of them, but quite a few. Yeah, I'm. It's. Uh, I think it's just a matter of finding the right bit. So I didn't get that. Could you try again? Let's see what else we got here. All right. We are at um one hour and ten minutes so far, guys. Um let's see if any it doesn't look like anybody else has any questions about what we've covered so far tonight. Um yeah. So we've done three live streams so far. We've talked about this flag. Uh, if I take this flag any further, um, I think it would uh, have to be done in the shop in a video format. Uh, and then I would bring either a standalone video showing you the cutting of this flag, uh, or um, I would have to take snippets of that uh, process and bring them into another live stream. So, And I may do that. Or I may just take snippets of my next project uh, or the next flag that I carve and bring it in and show it to you so you can see it actually in process uh, on uh, uh, the CNC. So let me uh, go ahead and share again um, the... Um, let's see, where did it... I keep... Oops. Oh. Got to get used to this here. Let me bring that over here. There we go. Uh, let me show you one other thing that I do. Uh, and that's before I get ready to carve this thing. Uh, not all CNC machines have this capability, but Avid does. And it's one of the things that I love about the Avid CNC um, is the ability to run all the, your, your tool paths uh, as one G-code file. But in order to do that, you have to do something specific and you have to number your tools. Uh, so when it copies it to the, uh, the, the final file, it knows what it's looking at. So for example, if I look at this first tool path, the 90 degree V-bit, um, let's see, where is it? It's right here. Whoops, close. That's not what I want. You can see right here under on the second line when I hover over that, see how it says number one, that means uh, right before RC1102, that means it's the first tool that it's gonna run, that's gonna be run. Uh, I want this second one right here to be number two, and it is showing number two. This should be three. It's three. This should be four, but it's not four. It's showing zero. If you see that, 
on the second line, the first within brackets, it shows that zero. So we need to change that. Uh, and how we do that is we come up, we actually open up that specific tool path and we open up edit under the tool. And we said we wanted it to be what, four. So we come down here to tool number one, two, three, four, and we hit okay. And then we hit calculate again, just so it saves it again. Let's close it. So now if we hover over it, it's the fourth. It says number four there. Second line down again, you can see that number four in brackets. This should be five, and it is five. This should also be five, and I say it should be five. Even though it's another tool path, it's still the same tool. So what the machine will do is it'll pause uh, after 45 V V carve. Uh, for just a second or two, and then it'll go to this one and it'll run this one. It won't pause and tell you to change out your tool because it is the same tool. And then this last one uh, is officer text. I always leave this one as zero. I don't run it as six. Uh, I kind of actually, when I save them, I won't save this one with these other uh, top ones uh, just because that... Uh, this right here, this stripe actually receives a color. Uh, so we've cut it out uh, on the CNC. So that's uh, showing bare wood. Now we got to cover color it with like blue or uh, gray or green for the military or some specific type of color. And we got to let it, you know, dry a day or two, sand it, maybe put another coat on there. And then we're going to put it back in the CNC on uh, the same fixture offset that we had originally. And then we can go ahead and cut the officer text separately. Um, so, um, when I go ahead and save them, uh, my post processor is Avid CNC. I would just come here and save these top ones uh, without the uh, officer text and then save toolpath. And then I could go ahead and name it and save it in any destination I wanted to. So that is uh, how that's done. So anyway, let's see here. Uh, thanks, John. Mark saying, uh, be careful with Siri. Yeah, she's, that's twice she's started talking to me tonight. Um, let's see. Great video with a lot of information. Thank you very much for that compliment. Let's see. I think Avid brought into live stream. I think Avid brought into live stream would be a cool format. Yeah, you know, the only problem is, is out in my shop, which is not here at the house. Again, I would run into internet issues uh, trying to stream something live from my shop. If I had cable internet or I had fiber or something like that, it would be a totally different ball ballgame. Uh, but that's kind of, uh, I would be using multiple routers and it would be real difficult. Um, but I could certainly do like individual snippets of video and put them on the live stream, uh, as well. Um, that would be just as good. So, uh, following your next flat card would be very cool. Next, I think folks would get a lot of value from watching your fixture setup. Yeah, I agree. Um, and my fixture setup, like I say, I modeled it after Jay Bates. If you guys follow Jay Bates' channel or have seen what he's done with his Avid machine, um, he's got a series of holes that are uh, capable of accepting uh, dogs. And I just put my dogs where I want to on these holes on my spoil board. And... Um, it allows me to position my my pieces anywhere I want, practically on the spoil board. And once I've secured them down, uh, I don't like clamp so much, um, but I'll use uh, lateral clamping uh, to hold my work pieces in in place. Uh, then uh, I'm I'm able to cut, and I can uh, de designate that as any offset I want to in Mach four, whether it's G55 through. G59. I think those are the available offset positions that are that I can use. Um, let's see. Yes, Mark, uh, video, you're right. Uh, let's see. Um, Dan, I would like to see it. Uh, you know, I do have some video carves on my channel. 
Um, one where I actually did this Arizona flag that I showed you guys a little while ago. Uh, I took you, I, I take you through the entire process of designing that flag and cutting it on the CNC. So if you're interested in watching that video, I highly recommend it. Uh, it highlights what we do in uh, VCarve, in mock, uh, on the CNC. I mean, I, it's a four part series. It's long. If you want to sit there one night and watch all four parts, you're going to be there for, you know, a good hour and a half. But, and I had to split it up. Uh, but it, it's worthwhile watching. It shows my whole workflow and my whole process. Uh, let's see. All right. TSO uh, Colorado Woodworking. TSO has free downloadable CAD files that are Festool MFT spacing. I did not know that. You know, I uh, my dogs are TSO dogs. And um, I, I used, I mean, I took a, a set of calipers and actually measured them. I, th what, I, I think they were like 19 millimeters, if I'm not mistaken, or something. They're, they're metric, if, I'm, if I remember right. And... <clears throat> Uh, I just used my calipers and I knew what size I just went a little bigger with my holes, uh, by a few thousands and they fit in there really snug, uh, but they work great. I, I just love those dogs and being able to, to pull them out and put them wherever I want to on the spoil board for whatever project I want. Uh, Mark, what is TSO? That's the name of the company that makes these little metal dogs. And I wish I had one here with me. They're out in the shop. Uh, they're made out of aluminum and, uh, they're billet aluminum and they're just real high quality um, that uh, kind of they're designed to, to slip into uh, a, a, a dog type workbench environment where you can position your your material any way you want. And it's not just for CNC machines. Uh, Jay Bates adapted them to his CNC and I just kind of went with the flow. I mean, if you like what somebody's doing out there, you know, why reinvent the wheel? Uh, it worked for me. Um, let's see. So, yeah. Any other questions before we call it guys? I think we had a good session tonight and I don't know when the next one's going to be. It'll probably be within another week or two, hopefully. Um, the reason I didn't, uh, have one last week is I was out of town. I was down in San Diego on business. I know, lucky me. Uh, but uh, I was there for a conf uh, some conference preparations uh, that's upcoming in April uh, for an organization that I'm part of. So I had to go down there. So uh, Colorado Woodworking, it's awesome because many of the MFT fixturing, triangles, jigs, et cetera, all fit my shop saber spoil board. So that is, yeah, that's good to know. Um, I didn't use their um, downloadable CAD files, um, but uh, in retrospect, now that I know they're available, if I ever resurface my uh, spoil board and redo it, I'm going to have to take a serious look at that. So thank you for bringing that up. That's definitely uh, something to consider. Um so their dog stops are incredibly useful in CNC content. Yeah, they are. Uh, I love them because I, I laterally, I clamp laterally. I very rarely use um, uh, the blue tape and the CA glue, although that is a, a very uh, great way to hold your hold down your material. I will use that method when I'm using a through cut uh, and um trying to cut, cut something out. I will have a sacrificial spoil board that I secure down to my actual spoil board. Uh, I kind of try to salvage my spoil board. I baby it probably more than I should. So I put a sacrificial spoil, board, spoil board down on my real spoil board. And then uh, I'll use the blue tape and CA uh, glue to secure my workpiece to that. Uh, and I absolutely love it. It works great. So uh, let's see. Hey, Doug, welcome uh, to the show. Uh, actually, we're about ready to wrap it up. If you're just tuning in, but that's okay. Better late than never. Uh, please be sure to catch it on replay. So I think we'll call it. Um, if you guys are happy, I'm happy. So and uh, uh, let's see here. What did I do? <laughs> Excuse me. 
Uh, let's get rid of that there, Brand. Okay, so we will call it uh, an, an evening. You guys are great. You are what makes my channel, what gives me the desire to do this when I feel like I'm coming out here and I'm actually doing something that is teaching you about something maybe that you didn't know or you're giving me something that I didn't know. I mean, there's always an exchange of information that takes place on this. Um, I would like to to start uh, maybe in the, the in the coming weeks, uh, get some guests on the uh, the show with me. So, if some of you have some expertise in certain areas that you'd like to talk about, uh, I would definitely like to have you on as a guest, and we can tag team it and talk about things. Uh, I think that'll help. Uh, you out, uh, especially if you sell products uh, or you want to get some name recognition out there for yourself. Uh, and it'll help me out too. It helps me, me out when I can bring people in on my end as well. So uh, if you want to do that, please reach out to me uh, and uh, uh, hit me up on my website. There's a contact us page and uh, you can uh, reach me there. And I will, I promise I answer all of my correspondence. So, um, hey, if you're not a subscriber to my YouTube channel, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Be sure to hit the thumbs up on this video, like this video, and hit the bell icon down there, somewhere down there. And uh, so you can be notified when I post new content. Uh, I'm also available on social media as Blue Line Wood Flags on Facebook and Instagram. You'll be able to find me there. And uh, again, my website, www.bluelinewoodflags.com. Uh, my contact page, my products page, a uh, whole bunch of stuff there. So hope you uh, uh, like looking at that. So with that said, you guys have a wonderful night and we'll see you in a week or two.